and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Kathy Hoverman, and I am uh, with the ASCE EWRI and AFS BES Joint Committee on Fisheries, Engineering, and Science. This is our webinar series. We do four a year, and this is the first one for 2021. Uh, for everyone's knowledge, this is being recorded. Um, and we are working on developing a YouTube channel in which we will place all of our various um, webinars that we've had. Uh, we've only been recording a few of them, so it won't be the whole host of them that we've done for the last four years, but um, we've probably got the last four or five available. So um, a little housekeeping for today. Everyone's on mute. You will have the opportunity to ask questions by using the chat window. Um, feel free to put those questions in at any time. However, we are going to hold off questions until the end of the meeting. Um, there are more presentations to come over this year. The next webinar will be in May 2021 with Gwen McDonald from Save the Sound uh, to talk about their various programs with fish passage and fisheries. So look for that announcement coming out in the next week or so, or sorry, the next month or so, that is. Um, as far as um, your view, if you double click on the presentation screen, that should enlarge it. Um, or if you have, can pick a layout, pick the layout for presentation view, that will also give you a little bit better viewing. If you're following along on the PDFs, uh, our presenter is going to try to identify the pages that he's on on occasion, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow along with. So with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Today we have Bill Rice from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to discuss different methods and modeling employed to design fish ramps and their utility and stability in the river environment and much more. Uh, Bill has been with the Fish and Wildlife Service since 2004 as an engineer and hydrologist conducting aquatic restoration and fish passage work. He holds a BS in geotechnical engineering from Colorado School of Mines and a master's in watershed science from Colorado State University. Bill has designed and guided hundreds of fish, pass and pro fish passage projects for a host of salmonid and non-salmonid species at road crossings, nature-like, and technical fishways across Alaska, Intermountain, and Great Plains regions. So, Bill, uh, I'd love for you to take it away. Bill, if you're talking, uh, we can't hear you. You might need to unmute on your end. I'm sorry, folks, just hang on while we get Bill uh, reconnected here with his uh, audio. Bill, see if you can find your name in the... Um, in the scroll box and uh, see if you can click to unmute. Okay, can everybody hear me here? Hello? Yes, yes we got you now. All right. Sorry about that. All right, we'll get into it. Uh, again, I'm, I'm Bill Rice. I'm a fish pass engineer in the National Fish Passage Program in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is a national program uh, that works with uh, just about anyone that is willing to, uh, on a voluntary basis, uh, put fish passage and improve fish passage on their landscapes, uh, private landowners, municipalities, uh, other agencies, what have you. Um, again, I work in the Air Mountain West and Great Plains, and this talk is going <clears> to <throat> be specific to fish ramps. Of course, there's a lot of ways to get uh, fish passage up and over dams and ideally to remove them, but there, that isn't always the case across our landscape. Um, one of the reasons fish ramps and other actions are needed on dams is that there are a lot of them. <clears throat> and 
on the map here that you can see on uh, slide two, we have a national inventory of dams um, across the United States. Um, and if you look at west of the Mississippi here, this blue line, um, you'll see that about 55% of the dams in the nation are located west of the Mississippi. And that <clears throat> total amount is about 22,000 dams uh, west of the Mississippi there. And here I've highlighted the, uh, the Great Plains and Intermountain West regions. Um, and when I use the word region, this is the area that I mean here. So we have Plains and Intermountain area, um, which encompasses probably three quarters of those dams um, documented uh, west of the Mississippi. But of course, uh, as Mark Twain said, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over. And in our uh, arid to desert and semi-arid environments, uh, water is at a premium. And so uh, we need to figure out ways that we can get fish over these structures and, and keep connectivity while allowing people to get their water use. <clears throat> One of the ways we do that is figuring out how many undocumented dams there, there are. And um, even though we have this national inventory, it does not document everything. One, we don't have an inventory across our area, our region. Uh, one way we can do think of this, though, is look at uh, our southeast portion of the nation, looking at the Southeast Aquatic Resource Partnerships efforts over the past decade in looking at these various states in the southeast. And the graph on the left, you can see these different states listed here. And the blue is the national inventory of dams as per 2020 um, and what's documented in them in the national inventory. The red is what their aquatic teams have been uh, documenting um, over the past decade. And so you can see that there's a lot of undocumented dams out there for water supply and irrigation primarily. And uh, we expect this or more across the, the western regions that we work in. And we are actively trying to document these as we go along, but it's a long process. <clears throat> what these supply and irrigation diversions work would look like um, in our area, this is a couple of examples from Montana. Uh, these are t uh, these diversions that we work on in the, our program are typically less than three meters in height, so they're what we call low head dams. And uh, they're primarily like for the wooden metal one on the left here in the Big Hole Valley. Um, they're getting a farmer's irrigation water here. And, um, and sometimes they'll have some type of structure on them. You see this little denial weir on them. That's quite common in Montana, um, unlike elsewhere. Uh, but those are specific for typically uh, only salmonid type of species. Um, another example is from wood and metal is uh, just pushing up some rock in the river, like here at the Allendale Canal intake um, in Montana as well. Um, because of water rights uh, and how the, how they're in the West, um, in, uh, a lot of folks have uh, free reign to put these you know, bulldoze up some rocks, um, put in um, broken concrete or what have you here to backwater a little bit to get water through here. A lot of these um, structures were put in many years ago, over 50 years ago. So what we're finding is that a lot of these structures, um, especially the mom and pop type of structures, are uh, are having to be redone, and uh, because they're at the end of their useful life, and uh, over half, I think, of our programs proposals that we get are now dealing with these types of low head dams. Of course, there's a lot of ways to get fish up and over these things. This is a, just a schematic of the different types of fishways that are out there, and Every, everything from super technical to then nature-like. What we're going to concentrate, obviously, is on the nature-like aspects of uh, various fishways. These are engineered. They're not natural um, and quite highly engineered. And so we're going to use the term nature-like in this talk. Um, <clears throat> we're going to concentrate on ramps and partial ramps, partial ramps being only partway across the river, ramps being the full river width and then talk about some design alternatives between both rough and channel through step pool options. So fish ramps in this region, um, we wanna, I want to highlight there's uh, ungrouted and both and also concrete grouted, grouted types of ramps. Um, and uh, we're going to concentrate on the ungrouted portions for this talk. And there's three um, major design alternatives in, that I've seen across this region, um, both rough and ramp, um, and then with steps, and then a formal step pool morphology. 
and we'll walk through these um, when we get through the design process. Just quickly on the grouted nature like ramps, um, here's a couple of examples. Again, we're not going to talk about these very much. Um, the grouted ones are typically made for specific species, uh, typically non-salmonid, um, such as the one in Big Creek here on the left in Wyoming. Um, and then uh, and then for some maybe some larger uh, non-salmonid species here in the Harlan Dam in the Colorado River. But again, we're going to hit the ungrouted nature-like ones and uh, just a couple more examples here and kind of go through these methodologies. <clears throat> The design criteria that are out there um, have a bit of a range, and so um, we're going to start on the right here um, on the East Coast. This is a Region 5 of the Fish and Wildlife Services Design Criteria Manual. There's a and the Nature Like Fishway Design Guidelines that were done um, as an interagency effort. Um, these are these are good places to start with. They have some design components that we can use here in the Plains and Intermountain region. The fish performance aspects are obviously on the East Coast oriented, but a lot of the other portions of them are applicable to designing of rocky ramps in our area. <clears throat> Moving towards the Midwest, what is used a lot is uh, Luther Adlin's uh, efforts here with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources in their book Reconnecting Rivers. They call it natural channel design. We're calling it um, nature-like design because these are still highly engineered types of structures. They uh, are primarily uh, used for lake sturgeon uh, restoration efforts in Minnesota. And that methodology in a kind of a more formal step pool environment has been um, used across the plains as well. And uh, some really good information on how those design aspects are put in there. <clears throat> Moving towards more from the plains, towards the Intermountain region, we got Technical Supplement 14, the National Resource and Conservation Services Fish Passage Design Guidelines. There's, there's some pages devoted to fish ramps in that technical supplement, um, especially on the aspects of, of sizing and designing the rock aspects of them. And the, the standard um, when looking at how to build stable rocky ramps is the Bureau of Reclamation's um, rocky Ramp Design Guidelines come out in 2007, and again, this, this talks about how to design a stable uh, rocky ramp, and but does not have real fish performance metrics on it. Um, those are added on top of that sta stable design once, it, once you do have a design made from those guidelines. So these are the design <coughs> uh, criteria that guide our work. Of course, when we talk about design, we start with the biology. Um, and then move into hydrology and hydraulics. Uh, with the biology, as with any fishway, you're talking about how to get the uh, smallest fish uh, uh, that you want, your largest fish through the fish passage structure, and of course the biomass, the amount of fish that you're trying to get through during their migration periods, if they have migration periods. There are over 250 different fish species in the Great Plains and Intermountain West, and a lot of those, and most of those, are non-salmonid oriented and not a lot of those are uh, very well studied for their performance metrics either. So it becomes um, looking at being playing very conservatively and hoping that you get the, the, the right mix. And that's the power of Rocky Ramps is you got a lot of velocity differences that, that can allow different species to get up, up down. So a lot of the times in our region, we're dealing with a, a, a trout species, a salmonid species, and a, and a small, less than 100 millimeter in size non-salmonid, um, and trying to get them both up the same type of ramp. Um, of course, we do have some larger non-salmonids, our pallids, our sturgeons, um, those types of species. They don't really jump. Um, they don't really, uh, they're bottom dwellers. Um, so if you're anything large but not and non-salmonid, except for being a carp, um, you have special aspects, you have needs that you have to take care of. And of course, we have salmon on our western intermountain parts of our intermountain area, and we also have other migrations, walleyes and suckers and other larger fish that we need to, to accomplish, especially on a partial ramp, making sure it's big enough to accomplish and get those fish up through without uh, delaying that migration too much. So again, for the smallest species, we're concentrating on the need for low water velocities and turbulence, especially in our region. Small non-salmonids are quite susceptible to turbulence issues uh, that we have in our deserts and Great Plains. 
<clears throat> and also uh, the largest ones, they primarily need depth and space. They do, but they have larger turbulence uh, limitations and velocity limitations to watch out for. And of course, we need space for our biomass as well. <clears throat> Some examples of the performance aspects of these fish. Um, I like this one from Colorado Parks and Wildlife in 2015. They've since updated this, but I, I, I like it because it shows quite clearly the differences that we work through. Um, here are non stomonids our minnows and darters, daces and suckers and their velocity efforts. And you can see that compared to trout, they're half the, the abilities that trout and salmonids have, at least. Um, this is burst velocity, um, excuse me, burst velocity here. Um, and, and, uh, and the other aspect here is their vertical drop. So um, the other aspect to look at is that their jump ability is about zero. And so while trout and other monads cannot, and that plays a huge role in the type of ramp you want to design in our region. <clears throat> Moving on to hydrology, just a, a couple of aspects to here. Obviously, we have our design flows for keeping a stable structure, looking at either 25, 50, or 100-year flow events. Um, I've seen some of these designs for, for these three off and on. Probably more in the last five years or more, people are only designing for that 100-year flow event. Um, which makes sense um, in this day and age. And, uh, and these dotted lines here in the schematic uh, represent the high and low fish passage um, flows over a typical weir or rock step in a ramp. Um, on top of that, we have to look at our, either our, our fish migration flows or high and low fish passage flow options. Um, they're either migration oriented or some type of seasonal orientation. Um, and Typically, we start with the 5 and 95% annual flow duration curve. So what is, um, what is the flows of an average annual year most of the time we want our, our fish to get through? Or just a season, seasonality to what you want to get fish up, up this ramp for, and that's a consideration. Taking all of that, <clears throat> kind of going into the modeling realm, um, one dimension works fine most of the time is what we find out here. Uh, 2D is becoming much more and more common and people do it as a matter of course a lot of times now. It's more important if you have complicated hydraulics, braided sinuous channels, outside bends, that sort of thing. And we typically don't see 3D modeling on our, our rock ramps, um, especially on these low head dams where it's more mom and pop oriented. There's just not the money available um, and there we see that more in large scale um, expensive or research oriented applications. When you think of Manning's N in modeling that plays a huge role in how a model can show the fish performance as well as the stability of the structure and Manning's N is of course the, uh, the representation of channel roughness as Manning N goes up velocities go down but turbulence also goes up and that interplay between velocity turbulence and channel roughness um, <clears throat> is the balance that one must achieve when getting trying to get fish up a ramp. So what we recommend is being conservative. Pick a value we see in natural rivers that it ranges from 0.025 to 0.045 range. That's the sweet spot if you can do it. Um, if you cannot, then watch the modeling efforts versus reality. You know, Manning's higher than 0.04 may be problematic. If you, if you are dealing with a rocky ramp that's greater than 1% in slope, really run your turbulence numbers and be aware of them. <clears throat> you know, a model can give you, it allows you to put whatever in for, in for Manning's N. I've seen 0.08, I've seen even 1.0. But those are Manning's Ns that you find on floodplains with a lot of vegetation and down trees. And trying to, to realistically simulate that in a main stem flow um, with, with roughness uh, gives you, may give you, uh, likely give you a ton of turbulence issues. So some of the differences here between a roughened channel towards the step pool rock ramp in, a, in calculations and design process um, is the hydraulic controls. Um, hydraulic controls on the roughened ramp are influenced by channel roughness or friction, so the Manning's N equations uh, apply. On the step pool, you see here 
um, that it's a series of weirs um, going downstream. And these, so the hydraulic control here is weir equations, weir flow and coefficient C. And there's two types of weir flow, and we'll get into that a bit later, but there's submerged and free flow weir flow. When we look at slopes, um, we in the Fish and Wildlife, we recommend that you design these, these rough and channels at 3% or less. Um, that is uh, fairly well documented here in the Plains and Air Mountain region. Um, a lot of research by Colorado State University and up in the uh, Montana State University showing that um, um, anything 5% or less can pass a, um, a fair bit of the uh, non salmonid species. But at 3% or less um, is, is the sweet spot. You, that's where you get a lot of the variation of species able to pass these structures. Um, concurrently on a step pool, these can be increased up to 5%. Again, if the fish can jump that you're, des you're designing this to, um, note that salmonids themselves, uh, yeah, it can get pretty steep and they can still make, make their way up there. The last difference here is, uh, is for rough and channels, they're a resilient design. It's not as susceptible to unexpected high flows and shifts in uh, material. Um, it's pretty flexible design in that regard, and especially in the ungrouted sense. For step pools, um, some monitoring level and maintenance may be necessary um, when you end up with small alterations in, the, in these steps. Any change to these steps is going to change those weird hydraulic equations and may affect the performance of your fish. <clears throat> so here in uh, slide 17, I'm going to talk a little through the design procedure. Um, you can see here a schematic um, looking at a plan view of a, of a rocky ramp with the flow coming from top to bottom and the cross section here. Typically, uh, these are designed with a low flow arena and a high flow arena for fish passage. So uh, here in the procedures, you end up selecting your initial ramp diameter, slope and man exam, and calculating your low flow parameters and hydraulics. And that gives you kind of a start to saying what the slope and such might be. And then you iterate that um, and get that squared away and make sure you have got enough depth for the low flow to get fish up and through. And then you end up calculating your high flow hydraulics. And there's two high flows that you have to be concerned with. One is the high fish passage flow, which you know typically these structures are built below or up to bank full. And so you're designing these, um, these structures to deal with that high fish passage flow within that environment and then they're kind of building up over them for some, some headroom. And then um, you're designing for your uh, stability factors, so your 100-year flow event, so that they are stable. And so you, you run those iterations. And then once you get those set, you start conducting your riprap design. Now, there's a lot of, of, of more steps in these procedures. And I recommend you guys look at the Rocky Ramp Design Guidelines because it it, it is a good way of, of walking through the procedure itself. Um, it also describes uh, the different types of riprap design methods in this cloud. Um, I particularly like the U.S. Corps of Engineers uh, 1991 uh, equations. Um, and then I also include some of these equations, some of the Rosgen um, stuff, as well as NRCS technical supplement, because um, research and, and information have been improved since uh, 2007 for these types of, for these others. So these are why they're outside the cloud. They're not as described in these guidelines. After iterating and all that, um, uh, realize that the riprap is 30 to 50 percent void space um, when you design it. And so you, you want to also make a well-graded mixture so that you keep the, the, the water on top of the ramp. Um, ensuring enough fines are in it and such. And so there's ways to do that with the Fuller-Thompson equation and other types of equations to maximize that density, make a well-graded mixture, not lose your river into your ramp, and keep water on top of it. Um, after you've done through, all through that, you look at your entrance and exit transitions, do a biological review, go back and see, make sure that your high and low fish passage performance metrics are being met, and then add your special features. Uh, boulders, clusters, step pools, what have you, onto the stable ramp itself. So that's the basic design procedure laid out in, by view of reclamation. Again, we're going to um, talk through these three design alternatives. We're going to look at some examples 
of uh, designs have been put out on the landscape and um, and what they look like. And so this is an example from the Little, Little Medicine Bow River in Wyoming. This is a grade control fish ramp. There is a bridge here um, on the plan view. And this plan view is fairly busy. And so there's only a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, you can see that it's it's a very thick material. This thing should not go anywhere within that 100-year flow event. Um, this ramp was designed to pass warm um, warm water species, a couple of types of daces, long-nosed dace and another, as well as um, stone rollers. And this was designed at a 4% slope. So a little more than what we would recommend in the Fish and Wildlife, but still below the 5% that uh, Colorado State University has been finding is the is where these fish would pass. And um, one thing is that the questions I've got is how do you design the, the roughness top here um, between the boulders and making the actual riffle top itself. And what you find a lot of times is that you'll have uh, notes like this where you're saying large boulders be placed at variable elevations to create complex channel geometry as directed by the engineer. And so it becomes a sort of a bit of an art form by the field engineer to design that. And so let's look at what happened in this one. Um, this one looks like it's got a lot of good roughness features, definitely engineered. It's not looking like a natu the natural creek, um, but it's got a lot of good diversity in it. And I have been have been asked, what, how do you design um, and pop these rocks up to, to get fish passage performance? Um, and I will say that in my view, the guidelines for placing these habitat boulders and such are not not out there in in any real detail. There needs to be some study involved with how we place these habitat boulders. I will say that um, if you're using like a one-dimensional or 2D model and you are getting your average velocities correct with your riprap rocky ramp design, that you may not have to place boulders such that you're trying to get a uh, fish from one boulder to the next because your overall is working within that fish performance metric. Um, however, if you are on the edge and you're not getting your average velocities in your model to work for the fish, you may have to uh, make sure you have enough um, habitat boulders in there so that a fish can go from one to another. And, and that becomes a sort of a art, I guess you might say, and an estimation. Um, what I will not go into on the left here, and I, I can on, if there's a question at the end, is these other aspects here. These aspects are from river restoration literature that I uh, found over the years and are more involved with um, how, how stable these habitat boulders should be in the, in the environment of that main channel. Um, I do want to look on the right here and say it's, it's discussed the concept of this wake length for spacing. Um, this is the, a little schematic from, uh, from the uh, Fishinich uh, 1999 um, little article and looking at a boulder here with their scour zone and turbulence, but there also is a low velocity wake that comes for a certain distance downstream from this boulder. And so you don't want to put a boulder down here within that wake because it's already lowered the velocities in it. So what, what you, the concept is, is to put boulders outside the wakes of these upstream boulders such that um, you get a low flow regime uh, that a fish can connect to and go boulder to boulder upstream. Going on with the second rocky ramp that we, uh, rough and ramp that we want to look at is on Granby. This was put in last year actually in uh, Granby, Colorado on the Fraser River. This is a municipal intake here for the municipal water supply of Granby. It's a rocky, um, very rocky, uh, um, dam here that is about seven feet high. What was put here was a uh, rocky ramp slope that was 3.7 percent. This was um, designed for both for brown and rainbows trout as well as modeled sculpin. And modeled sculpin you would think would have pretty low performance metric and they do. Um, in the modeling what they were able to do here uh, shown in plan view is, is be able to get model scoping to go up along the margins of the of whatever fish passage flow level there is and go along the outside edges. And that was acceptable on uh, for sculpins. They don't need to travel up the center of the of the river. And and of course trout had no problem going up here. Um, 
some of the aspects on this plan view that to note is the lines of rocks here um, that used to maneuver the Thalwag, the low flow channel a little bit down through this rocky ramp. This rocky ramp ended up 180 feet long. And, um, and some of the habitat boulders here <clears throat> you can see stuck in, um, particularly along the edges of that low flow channel, kind of that low flow regime, um, middle of the channel area was where um, they wanted to make sure that there was enough um, uh, uh, connectivity with it. Um, if there wasn't um, before, there would be with these habitat boulders. Um, this is a, a walking pedestrian bridge downstream. Um, and so this picture is looking from the pedestrian bridge upstream towards Highway 40. Highway 40 is right here. You can see that even though this is a highly engineered channel, it's a very natural looking channel. And you can see these habitat boulders that are popped up here, um, definitely for aesthetics, but also provide scour holes. Uh, one of the things here was uh, um, fishing, and so it provides some cover for um, fishing actions as well. <clears throat> what you don't see are the lines of rocks, and these lines of rocks are um, primarily for grade control. So you can see here in profile, but they only come up to the bottom of the um, of the uh, low part of the of the ramp. And so that's why they don't pop up like the habitat boulders. So here's a, a very nature-like, nature-like riffle ramp. Moving on to a uh, riffle ramp with steps, you can see here that uh, this is a project in Horse Creek um, for Snake River Cutthroats, um, looking at putting a grade control uh, riffle ramp through a uh, culvert replacement. Um, and to, uh, a couple things to note here on profile, um, these grade controls are bumping up about a foot each every time they go up, but there is no formal pool behind them. So in this regard, <clears throat> you'll see that uh, that's why we call it a riffle ramp with steps. These are grade control steps, but they also are, are uh, popping the grade up um, uh, each time they show themselves. Um, what's nice here is they do provide some gaps in between those rocks um, that would help for small fish, of course, and and other fish, they're not right up against each other. But also they've got some habitat rocks in between. I don't have a picture of that one per se, but I do have one um, in Nebraska in the middle loop. And one thing I want to point here is these lines of rocks. These are the steps. There's uh, gaps between them, but there is no formal pool in between these rocks. So that's an example of kind of a visual of that. And now we go to the formal step pool rock ramps. And this, if you Google step pool rock ramps, you're gonna come up with this in Google every single time. It's all over the web. Um, so there's nothing new here. We've got, we've got formal steps made um, that, that fish can jump through or get through between the rocks in and rest in the pool and go up in either a partial sense or the full river. <clears throat> a couple of aspects of step pool approaches in our inner mountain region is that uh, is uh, this is a cross vein design for step pool approach. Um, you can see that it's, uh, it's for irrigation, diverting that irrigation, but also providing um, uh, primarily, but also uh, non cell mounted passage, but also uh, primarily cell mounted passage in many, in many instances. And it's a formal um, design, Rosgen design. Here's one example on the blue. You can see the size of the rocks associated with these formal cross vein approaches and how it diverts water over to the intake. So this is, these are very common across the West. Another step pool approach, um, again, Luther Adlins um, and Department of, uh, and, and Minnesota, the state of Minnesota's approach here, um, <clears throat> looking at at uh, lake sturgeon and other species, again, um, looks very uh, much like a step pool approach. Um, it uses a lot of variation in the rocks, um, some gaps through them and such in order to get um, these bottom dwelling lake sturgeons either through the rocks to and then rest at these pools or at higher flows to get them up and over them, probably using submerged flow um, rear coefficient equations. So just a general analogy here on um, looking at these step pool rocks, ramps, looking at steeper ones versus not steeper ones. Obviously, the steeper you make it, the cheaper you make it, but you end up having to look at a higher drops per pool, higher water velocities, lower water depths, lower pool size, and higher turbulence. And again, those are fine if you're talking especially non-salmonid species, or salmonid species, 
But when you're talking non samanas, you may have to extend that out quite a bit. And of course, when you extend it out, all of these factors go opposite of each other. You got lower turbulence, lower velocities to deal with, and a better ability for non samanas to pass through. In cross section, you can see that you have two or three rock um, types of uh, for scour protection here at the steps. They're designed for the 100 year flow event stability. There's a uh, slope on the arms. There's either low flow notch or spaces between the rocks in order for uh, low flow speed and small species to get through. Um, when you talk about turbulence, um, I want to show that this in terms of uh, some recommendations that our Northeast region has put together. Um, turbulence in general is a equation of energy entering the pool over pool volume. And, um, and we call it uh, energy dissipation factor, or EDF. What we recommend in the fish and wildlife to keep that above one can facilitate fine sediment movement, keep your sands going through the system. Um, and then for non um we try to keep it very low, like two, two and a half if we can, although it's extremely, it's very little study. There's only a few studies that I know of in our region where we know that turbulence causes fish to forget or not be able to find upstream um, with even a little bit of turbulence in the system. And, um, and so this, this is an area that does need some more, more study. Another thing with these steps is the difference between free weirs and nature-like fishway weirs. Um, so free weir here is more designed um, to accommodate jumpers. Uh, Non-jumpers can not as easily get up and over this thing. Uh, sal salmonids, salmon, uh, carp, they're, they're able to get up through these things. What we look at and recommend for non-jumpers and in the non-salmonid environment are <clears throat> submerged, submerged weir flow equations. That allows them to hopefully get up through here um, a lot better. <clears throat> and um, this, is a <laughs> this is a busy slide, but, but I do want to point out that um, this is a plate from our Northeast engineers where you can take this into the field and um, slowly doing something like understanding the, if you know what your head difference is between uh, two steps, you can calculate through this, this plate and come up with a velocity in the field and compare that to the velocity metrics of your fish of interest and see if this is uh, passing fish or not. On the construction side, it's a tricky puzzle to put together. Your foot of rocks position so that sliding cannot occur, so they're kind of <clears throat> banked up against each other. On the back end, you want to tighten this up with geofabric, clay, and silt. Um, try to put these close together. Um, <clears throat> and in order to make a pool environment, and um, yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it takes some uh, finesse and time to put these together. So those were some of the examples and, and design thoughts there before these three alternatives. Again, they're all engineered fill. They're nature-like. We have some that are really pretty nature-looking. Um, we have steps that don't have pools, and we've got formal step pool morphology. So now I want to go into just a few slides about some of the research that's been done in our region over time, um, starting in the early 2000s here with Brent Mefford and the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Um, they did a lot of case study, uh, research and case studies, uh, looking at a, even to the degree of going to a full-scale rough and channel test facility here in Denver. And what they found was for non salmonid passage, and this in, in many ways is primarily for um, uh, species in the Colorado River um, and down in San Juan Basin, as well as uh, potentially in the Rio Grande, um, is that they found that the Chevron style angling um, and two different flows coming um, through these uh, steps were most effective in passing uh, salmonid species. And so what they wanted to design is something that could be reproducible, pretty easy to install. And a number of these actually got installed as side channels on a number of different dams across the West. Um, they came up with different angles, that best angles that to use for angling, um, gaps between the boulders, kind of some spacing there, and also um, some thoughts of how easy to make this. You have a tuning boulder and you have some other large boulders. So um, this was C, uh, simulated in a CFD three-dimensional environment and everything, and, and it worked really well. But they didn't stop there. What 
ended up happening is they then took this and said, well, could we do this in a technical fishway manner? So, um, so here uh, you can see the government highland version dam. Um, they actually made these chevrons out of metal and looked at a dual slot, uh, vertical slot fishway. Um, and to get non salmon is up through here. And this dual slot idea and the chevron idea was key in getting non salmon is up these facilities. Also, the same concepts applied towards a cylinder fishways. This is the price stub on the Colorado River to get non salmon as passage um, in a side channel. And that has worked well as well. <clears throat> Interestingly, in the 2000s, uh, in Australia, they also designed things called cone fishways. And this was developed in the, yeah, because in the outback and other places, they had a lack of rock uh, to make these rocky ramps. And they said, well, we got, you know, we got sand, we got a lot of ways to make concrete. And so these have been developed over time and have worked extremely well with the uh, small species in Australia and, and also been effective in Southeast Asia. And they've come in lots of different shapes and forms. So the rocky ramp analogs are a really interesting aspect of what's been developed over the last 20, 20 years. Other research out there is Colorado State University looking at different uh, rocky ramp. They have a rocky ramp simulator flume. Um, there's been a PhD and several master's students through here. Um, again, where we uh, gained a lot of understanding in the effective slopes and roughness and that sort of thing. The current uh, uh, student, master's student with Dr. Merrick is uh, looking at different types of surface roughness on passage success and effects of light levels as well. Um, and there's a couple more master students in the pipeline there. And then um, our Fish and Wildlife Services Fish Technology Center and Montana State University have had 12 year collaborative effort there in Bozeman, Montana. We have a fish passage flume shown here and have done many performance tests and, uh, and applications on the ground as well. Um, definitely a good place to check out. Lots of students uh, working on good research there. So that's some good things on the research. Um, on the monitoring side, uh, this is this paper that came out um, by uh, folks at the state of Colorado um, is one that just came out here in late 2020 and, um, and is probably the most extensive one that I know of in our region um, and there's a lot of information here uh, talking about this evaluation of a rock ramp fishway and also confirms a lot of the things that were found at Colorado State University. Two aspects out of this paper that I wanted to highlight was this idea of uh, variation of velocity near the bed and with depth average velocities. And so this, uh, page 42 here, this graphic up on the upper right, <clears throat> you can see that per fish weight discharges uh, versus average velocity, looking at the bottom and depth average and surface velocities at these different discharges, you can see how the bottom velocity in this dark column stays pretty low even as the discharge increases. And so what they found is even if the depth average velocity went above the fish performance burst velocities, um, if the bottom velocity stayed below that, the fish performance metrics, the fish were able to follow that bottom up and negotiate the, the fish weight. And that is great and, and it works with fish that can flow around the bottom, but if you have a, a middle swimmer, middle column swimmer, that's not, not as good an information to know. But, um, but what is nice here is if you do have these bottom swimmers that they, they can negotiate a much lower velocity than your depth average. Um, the other nice thing that came out of this was uh, the, when they formed this fishway in 2016, there was a, a jump there is a tr and a turbidity barrier here, a turbulence barrier. Um, non salmonids they, they could not get, negotiate this very well. And when they extended it, then they got a vast improvement in these non, non salmonid passage, these small fish less than 100 millimeters of daces and other fish. And so they were able to show that with elimination of jumps, um, they had greatly improved passage, which correlates to the non-jumping ability of these non salmonids So in closeout, um, I'd like to say, again, nature-like is not natural. We're not talking natural channel designs. These are highly engineered structures. Um, they range from riffolite to step pools. Great advantages there with aesthetics, with um, enhancing for multiple different species 
and you get upstream and downstream passage with these things pretty easily. And then the disadvantages are their size and the cost. Um, you know, pretty much you need three hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars to be doing one of these projects um, for the most part in our region. And uh, and then the need for more performance studies. While we have good performance studies in a few places, um, a few more would be really good to kind of tune in um, and get some better information, especially on how you space habitat folders out. Thank you. Um, and again, if people don't get their questions answered and such, I am I am quite open to getting them by email. You see my email here on the lower left, right? Thank you, Bill. That was awesome. Um, we did have quite a few people who had some uh, technical connection difficulties, um, and we did get the PDF out a little bit late. Hopefully, everyone will will or has received that PDF. Um, as mentioned, this was recorded, and we will be getting it up, so we will put that link out there to everybody once we get it up on our, our new YouTube channel. Um, go ahead and start asking some questions. We, we, Bill, we have some already started, so I'm going to read you the first one. Um, what reference gives rock size and gradation to achieve a certain roughness? Yeah, well, um, you know, I think if, I'm, if I don't whack everybody out maneuvering this uh, slideshow back, um, Yeah, I guess, you know, a number of these will. Um, again, I think, um, you know, take a look at these guidelines. You can download those off the web pretty easily and, and look through these design methods. Um, I think using this Corps of 1991 Corps of Engineers is a great starting point. It gives you um, uh, good, rip, good equations to conduct your riprap design. Um, and then for per channel roughness, um, you know, you look at your Manning's N. If you certainly, if your riprap has um, is and it ends up in the boulder size category, you're dealing with a high Manning's N value. Um, you just correlate those Manning's Ns to to what your riprap design is. Um, I guess that's that's the best way I could say it. Um, I think that yeah, that would be. That'd be where I leave that. <laughs> okay. Um, there, a, a kind of a similar question uh, um, came in through the email. Um, how do you size rock material for steeper slopes? For example, the core manual 1601 is identified as applicable to slopes less than 2%. So are these same manuals ones that you would say have the, the, rope, the right way to uh, size that material, or are you using something else for that? No, I would say these would be applicable to sizing above that 2% slope range. Yes. Okay, great. Um, another question for design bid build project delivery. Do you have suggestions on how to estimate the quantities and obtain bids for the number of boulders that may be required to provide complex stream channel geometry, uh, in quotes here, per the engineer, to ensure that a contractor's bid is responsive? Um, wow, I would say go by weight, go by numbers. What's your thoughts? Yeah, um, some of that depends on the agency doing it. Some, you know, like a Department of Transportation typically works by weights. Um, other entities um, work by number. And, um, and yeah, so so it just depends. Um, you know that that answer to that question is 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 a much longer uh, discussion. I think and so. Please email me that um, because I I do have some thoughts that way. It just would take a while for me to get get out a lot of that information. <laughs> um, but in general, you know, I I would say estimating um, given a nominal number of boulders, and if you if you can know their size. Um, and that you give it a certain strength, uh, you know, a competency, um, like a like a very solid rip boulder. People can estimate weight, and so if they're if they're then um, giving you uh, costs, they can. And if they need to go by cost or by number, they can go either way because they can calculate out the the amount of weight those boulders would be. Okay. 
Thank you. Next question. Can you speak about the extent of bottom roughness or variation to best benefit small and weak swimmers along the bottom low, low V margin, low V zone, sorry, low velocity? Yeah, you want, you want a lot of good roughness. I, what I always think of is, is looking at natural riffles and, and making sure that uh, what is put in <clears throat> has that kind of roughness associated with, with them. Um, the more roughness you have within your Manning's End of a natural river, of course, again, I, you know, we recommend staying within that 0.02 to 0.045 range. Um, the more you don't, the more roughness you have there, the more hidey holes um, the small fish will have. And, um, and, uh, and that is still needed within that low flow environment because um, depending on the species you're looking at, um, you know, we have species like uh, stone rollers and, and other types that will only move at night. They hide under rocks and, they, and, um, and they're going to need that type of, of uh, roughness in order to negotiate something of that nature. Whereas something like a darter or something will just shoot on through. But again, um, some of the darters that we have in our region have been looked at and they don't have any uh, slow muscles, uh, slow twitch muscles. They only have fast twitch. That's why they're called a darter and all they can do is dart uh, from place to place. And so when you, even darters need enough roughness so that they can dart to a rock and rest and then dart again. All right, we have a few more questions, more are coming in. Can you suggest a set of metrics to monitor for performance post-construction for structures that go across the whole width of the river? A set of metrics. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I think there are some some sheets out there that, that kind of lay some of those things out. But, um, you know, one thing is, 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 has it been designed uh, at the slope that, uh, that the design called for? Um, you know, one of the, and it sounds simple, but, you know, one of the things that folks have found is, is that, uh, you know, you design something that's at a 3% slope, and what tends to happen in the field is that it's, it's put in at a 35 or 4%. And it's kind of, it seems to be a natural aspect of, of construction for some reason that these things get put in just a little bit steeper than what your design is. And so looking at simple aspects like that, um, slope, um, using like if you have a step pool, using that plate that I showed where you're, you can get the differences in height, are the differences in height compared to design okay? Um, and if so, calc out kind of what the flow velocities are and compare that to, to your burst velocities of fish. Um, and then on the, on the spacing, I think I had a slide where, um, you know, if you're putting habitat boulders in and such, that those are put in so that you're not um, inadvertently uh, shooting a jet of water at your, at your uh, bank, unless, it's, unless the bank's armored, of course, um, and creating some excessive erosion in that way. Um, so some of those basic stability parameters would be um, well worth looking at. And I'm happy to answer more of that question. You know, there's a lot of a lot of things you could do. Um, you know, in looking at those at those um, rocky ramps. Um, happy to to talk to you more about that. Great. Okay, uh, we have more time, so we have more questions. Uh, do you have any <laughs> any guidance on width on very large rivers? Is there a width that is wide enough relative to a river that is a thousand plus feet wide? Uh, so I'm assuming that that um, yeah, if you if you're not, uh, I have not seen um, with being uh, and having a um, like a factor that you may be getting at there. Um, when you're looking at a partial ramp, you know um, what I see more often is that the guiding that is um, if you got a thousand foot river, it's going to be a very expensive project. So you tend to look at a partial ramp. And that partial ramp is more based on, you know, there is there is that kind of rule of thumb out there for any fishways that you want at least 10% of your river flow going through your fish passage fishway 
um, in order to provide enough attraction flow to that and to that fish can understand that that's the way to get up. Um, you know, that is kind of the rule of thumb. If once you get rivers too big, um, that 10% gets a little too much as well. And so then you, you, you kind of par that down and look at, you know, the two, two year event or something smaller of that nature and, and then si end up sizing your, your partial ramp to that metric. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be a thousand foot river. I mean, you know, there's plenty of times where you, you're, you, people are trying to figure it out from a partial ramp standpoint when, you know, it's not, uh, it's not going to garner the, the type of money and, and capital um, it's going to take to do an entire project across the entire river. And so, you know, you start thinking then of partial ramps and, um, and even technical fishways and, and uh, balancing the cost of those against each other. Uh, great general question here. What is the steepest rough and ramp step pool you have experienced? Yeah, well, um, you know, when I was working in Alaska, I, I in the Tongass, I always saw some of these um, uh, pictures from the Forest Service there, and uh, um, you know, obviously they they are uh, replacing culverts, but they're replacing culverts in a aquatic organism passage manner where they're embedding that pipe, and a lot of times you actually are putting some type of ramp up and through them, much like we saw in this Horse Creek example that I showed. And in those respects, that's why I put 15% in this in this slideshow is that's that's the maximum I've seen an actual picture of. And and according to the Forest Service, it's actually been working great. Of course, they're working with uh, salmonids in that environment uh, pretty much strictly and not worried about anything else in up, up that steep. Good. Uh, another question came in through our email. Uh, can you discuss how you require or specify washing in of the fine materials during construction to prevent the rocky ramp from losing surface flow during low flow conditions? Yeah, you know, the, the typical manner there is um, uh, it's pretty standard to put it in, in one foot lifts and wash the fines in. So you put your riprap, your larger component down and then you, and then you, your, uh, what you want to fill your void space with, and then basically wash it in. Then you have a sump at the end, and then you, you kind of uh, circulate that type of water, so you're not um, putting a lot of turbidity downstream in that manner. Um, that is probably the best way to do it because then you've you've already got some <clears throat> compaction uh, from water movement in there, and uh, and so that's the best way I've seen it done. Okay, um, I think we have one more time for one more question that came in on chat. Is riprap still an effective solution for large scale dams and rivers? Yeah, I am um, for large scale dams and rivers. Um, I would say yes. I it kind of depends on the on the scale you're talking about to some degree, but. Um, you know, I think for large scale dams and such, the costs are just going to get too large. And um, and then I would be um, balancing that in a cost benefit analysis with uh, with more technical fishways. Of course, it, it really depends on the species you're talking about. You know, rocky ramps are not a panacea for for these things. You still have issues with sediment transport. You still have issues with other things because you got this backwatered environment upstream, right upstream of it. And so, you know, these things are designed to just get fish up and over these things, but then they end up in this backwatered pool environment, which also has its issues, um, you know, with predation potentials and trying to understand if, how a fish, a fish understand what's upstream in this, in, in this lower velocity pool that they just got into. Um, so I would think it depends on the on the place and uh, the project and how it balances out with the costs and the species of interest. Great. Okay. If you can answer this next one in very short order, it's the last one we have, and we will close on this question. Um, 
the design procedures for rock ramps, they're quite old, uh, published in 2007. You've, you've mentioned a few other things that you use to supplement knowledge. Um, but do you know if there's another effort underway to update the methods in a single document? At this point, I do not know of any effort in that regard. I think um, it's a great point because uh, one of the impetus for me putting this show together is to kind of show what's out there and things and 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 um, hopefully people can start having that conversation because I think there's there's a lot to be that could be done in in putting together better design criteria and especially since you know some of the best stuff has been done you know way back in 07 and so yeah great point and I hope we can continue that conversation that's great. Well, well, Bill, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful presentation. Uh, lots of good questions. Thank you all for who have attended. Thank you for sticking around through some of the technical issues. And again, uh, we will send out the PDF one more time through the fisheries um, email address. I had sent it through my my person. Sorry, my my work email account. So you might see it come through me but we'll double down and send it through our fisheries email account as well. Um, thank you all. Thank you again, Bill. This has been great. Um, everyone have a great day. Thank you, everyone.